We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Vince Lancy, professor of MBA finance and publisher of the Goldfix Substack. Vince, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. It's always a always a pleasure to talk about or to talk about all of these things with you. And today's kind of going to be, you know, you and I talk quite a bit between episodes, and there's some kind of random thoughts that I want to cover with you. They don't necessarily all tie together, even though, you know, in the grand scheme of things, they always do. But why don't we start by talking about, let's say, the markets in this past week? What happened to kind of start to unravel the stock markets? And really the drawdowns we saw across the board, starting on Friday, August 2nd, it didn't really seem like we had a real catalyst to kind of kick that off. Um, But we'll get into the now, now, let's say, post hoc ascribed to reason that that might have been something to do with it. So let's start by getting your take on the markets for the past week here. All right. I'm going to start out by saying, holy shit, we just spent an hour, Tom, like shooting the shit about all kinds of things, which we also should Actually, record. Actually, it's more like, like an hour and a half. Enough. Yeah. And now, and now you're asking me, so let's talk about the markets. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> Um, all right, so, whoa, all right, it's like a complete brain, you know, hemorrhage. All right, so, so what happened last week? So you're alluding to the yen carry trade, right? And 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 whether that's the cause of what happened, the catalyst of what happened, or just uh, the final, um, the final brick, uh, or the, the the tipping point of other things that are going on it really remains to be seen. But but it almost feels like, and I can say this, this is a genuine statement. It almost feels like, again, in hindsight, when it was happening, I was like, oh shit, this could be really bad. Uh, it almost feels like all of the banks are looking for an excuse to get out or an excuse to not get out on it. Well, that too. They're looking for a means to convince the Fed to ease. So drug addiction uh, enabling behavior aside, leading up to the now famous yen uh, carry trade debacle, which is really just another thing for people to talk about, Mm -hmm. was the following. Uh, The Fed had raised rates for almost two years, over a year. People were talking about, oh, the Fed has to ease now, right? We've been waiting for the Fed to ease for a year. And every time the Fed comes out and says, dude, I'm not easing, Powell's like, I'm not easing. It's not 2%. The stock market dips for a day and then rallies again. It's, it's, it's you know, drug seeking behavior. Anyway, uh, when the Fed shouldn't have to ease. So the Fed has not, has been in a position where they don't have to ease for, a year now to say, well, inflation is not at 2%, stocks are on the highs. Inflation is not at 2%, stocks are on the highs. If you people continue to think that I'm going to have to ease, then I don't have to ease, right? And But then, and all these little things happen along that. But then last week, just to kind of recap it, uh, uh, Buffett, uh, and it, it's, it's disclosed that Buffett sold, you know, like 50%, maybe more of his Apple holdings. Mm-hmm. He's been selling Bank of America for a while. And, you know, he's sold in the past and, and banks are like, we don't care. It's going up. We don't care. It's going up anyway, you know. Uh, but now he sells. And two weeks ago, before the yen carry trade, Citibank puts out a puts out a report saying, all of a sudden, there's going to be seven rate cuts, you know, like a bill, seven 25 basis point rate cuts. And I'm like, that's aggressive. They're getting ahead of the pack. I'm like, why hasn't Goldman done that? And Goldman didn't do that. I concluded was because Goldman said it last time and they were wrong. So they're probably a little bit nervous about it. Fine. So I'm looking at the bank competition, you know, J, uh, JP Morgan and Goldman start, they start to relent. They start to say, okay, rate cuts are going to come. They start to pound the table on rate cuts because, and this is 
fair. This is real economic analysis. They look at the data and they see in the pipeline, looking at other real-time data that they get, they see in the pipeline another huge disinflationary uh, push coming. You know, like uh, uh, rents are going to stop going up. Uh, goods are going to stay down. People stop buying houses. And you start to see other, you start, like they see all this pipeline data. And so does the Fed, don't get me wrong. And, and they say, you know what? This pipeline data is almost 100% going to make it to the real, to the, to the, to the uh, monthly data. You better cut or we've got a problem. And I'm like going, ah, why are they going to cut? They didn't cut for SVB. They didn't cut when, you know, uh, Europe imploded. You know, they, they, they didn't cut. So he's not going to cut until it's 2%. But they're pressing. I mean, why are they pressing so hard? And 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 sure enough, the unemployment comes in. The unemployment comes out, uh, putting us technically not in the some rule recession. But for all intents and purposes, you can say that it is. So it depends on where you draw your line, like four point. 3% unemployment would have guaranteed a SOM recession uh, by the SOM indicator. And we came at 4.25. So if you round to 4.3, which is what you should do, we're in a recession. If you leave it at 4.25, technically we're not. So uh, so now you have that. And when that happens, Goldman and JP Morgan start saying, Citibank is right. We not only think we're going to have seven, we don't think we're going to have seven basis, seven 25 point basis cut. Cuts. We think we're going to have four basis cuts, two of them be 50 basis points. So everyone's saying, you know, different versions of the same thing. And I'm like, all right, maybe they, and I'm thinking like as a game player, I'm like, all right, maybe they sense it's going to come and they just want to get ahead of it. Maybe they see what the Fed sees and the Fed's like, all right, we're going to get, maybe there's one more CPI number that has to come out, which by the way, comes out next week. And I'm like, all right. So they're on the same page and they don't want to be late when the Fed cuts and they've missed it. And then the yen thing happens, you know, uh, uh, yen carry trade starts to blow up and, and the yen carry trade blows up because Japan says, says we're done letting inflation fester. We're going to start fighting inflation. Why? Because we can't afford to, literally, I mean, we can't afford to buy any more of our own bonds and then use that money uh, to, to keep our currency from going to zero. So we're going to let bond yields go up or actually encourage bond yields to go up. And we're going to strengthen the yen. And there's, there's sound economics to that. Basically, you know, when you've been, when you've been, Keeping long-term rates low forever, which is yield curve control, uh, and you you um uh, you let it manifest in the currency. The currency weakens, and you have inflation, and the inflation is not allowed to work its way out of the system because the long-term yields too artificially low, right? And 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 Japan says, all right, we're going to take our interest rates from 0.1 percent to 0.25 percent, and you're like, that's not much. But it is because 0.1% to 0.25% is 150 percent change. Now we look at that, and we say 150 percent. Yeah, but but you're not leveraged 20 times. And and so who's leveraged 20 times? Well, the hedge funds. I'm not blaming the hedge funds, uh, but that's what you do. The the funds, oh yeah, now I remember I, I, what I wrote about this. So so basically you're doing this yen carry trade. It's not a yen carry trade, it's a carry trade. Who's loaning me money the cheapest in the world? It used to be the Fed. We'll borrow from the Fed and we'll buy, you know, Apple. And the Fed's no longer loaning money. And now you've got Japan, which is saying, dude, we'll give you all the money you want at 0%. We love inflation. Take it. And so you go out there and you're, you're, you're any hedge fund manager, you say, all right, I'm going to borrow from Japan at 0.1%, right? And because, and this is key, because it's a country, it's not a company that has to worry about earnings from quarter to quarter, because it's a country policy and these things are very slow moving, I'm going to be able to see it coming. So I'm not going to borrow a million dollars. I'm going to borrow a hundred million because the risk isn't really big. And I'm going to take that hundred million and I'm going to buy something I think is going up. So it's not a true currency carry trade. So they go out there, they short bonds, 
Japanese bonds, right? Uh, uh, and they get the yen, and they convert the yen to dollars. The simple point is they borrow in yen, right? They borrow in yen, and they convert it to dollars, and they put it in something else. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to put it in another country's currency for it to be a pure carry trade. But the word is, and if you pull a chart up on this, you'll see that NVIDIA and the yen are like pretty much mirroring each other for the last uh, 40 days, uh, almost exactly. And for the last year, uh, more or less pretty, pretty tightly. So I'm a hedge fund manager. I've got to keep up with the guy across the street who's also got these returns from NVIDIA and everyone's buying NVIDIA and it's going out. It's like, well, fuck, you know, I guess, excuse my French. It's like, I'll just borrow from uh, Japan instead of it being a hundred million dollars. You know what? I'll buy NVIDIA on margin 10 to one with a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I got a billion dollars worth of NVIDIA secured with a hundred million dollars borrowed from Japan in yen. And then Japan says, we're going to increase interest rates, which makes me, through various machinations, have to uh, uh, refinance my borrowing at a higher rate, whether it be in currency losses or or borrowing. And so that 15 basis point jump on my $100 million gets leveraged to my billion dollars. And so what do I do? Normally, what do you do? Well, you you the refinancing comes and you reduce your leverage based on the amount of money. So I can only tie up a hundred million dollars. This makes me tie up $110 million. So my $10 million, which I have to reduce to cover my 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 yen risk, is really a hundred million dollars because it's long a hundred million dollars in NVIDIA. So I sell a hundred million dollars in NVIDIA. And I'm square. I still have my carry trade on. I'm not making as much money, but I'm square. But when every Tom, Dick, and Harry is doing it, it's like, he's doing it, he's doing it. And, you know, Drucken Miller even talked about this. Drucken Miller talked about it. I don't know if it was NVIDIA, but he talked about it. He's like, you know what? I don't usually play those things, but this portfolio manager is doing it. I'm like, I'll do a little bit myself. And so everyone starts doing it. And so now everyone starts unwinding. So they take a trade that's relatively low profit, uh, 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 and, and steady margin, and they leverage the crap out of it, and then it starts to unwind. So now you have your, call that the catalyst of what happened last week. That's what everyone's going to say. The yen, well, uh, it's either A, the yen caused it, the yen carry trade unwind caused it, mm -hmm. valid point, or B, the yen carry trade was the straw that broke the camel's back on all these other things. And I, I think it's probably a little bit of both, but when you look at you know, like, let's look at Warren Buffett for a second. He's a white knight. He's a good guy, you know? Yeah, right. All right. So Warren Buffett, who invested in Japanese financial companies over the last year, had been selling Japanese bonds and doing something with the money, probably long Apple with it. So when he sold Apple, he was unwinding probably a version of the carry trade. So they're all doing it. Anyway, so uh, uh, the, but apparently, right, this is to our conversation you and I had, but apparently it's fixed. It's gone. It's over. Mm -hmm. It's all unwound. So I don't know why we have to talk about it anymore. Well, yeah, it seems weird. Some of these news stories and news reports that we've been getting that, you know, apparently nobody knows the actual size of it, but there's all kinds of numbers in a couple of these stories that cite, you know, we're 75% done the, the carry trade. And I think that's a very profound point that it's not only, you know, borrowing one currency against the other to make the interest spread, it's borrowing one currency into the other to make a margined bet on, you know, NVIDIA or something, which I think is, is a more a more important point to understand the mechanics of that and then why the market actually reacts the way it does when you know market starts to go down you know i saw a really poignant tweet the other day that said since covid the stock markets have gone up 150% and at one point we were only down like 8% and yet right. everybody is screaming for the fed to cut rates and it's like 
you know, you can just tell everybody's kind of really nervously looking for the exits. It seems that the markets have some type of recognition about a bubble of some type or an overvaluation, but nobody wants to miss out on gains either. And I think that that's why, you know, there's such a a push in some ways in the market to make the Fed react right away. Because at least that's my perception is that many people recognize this condition that that is seemingly, you know, maybe unnatural. Maybe that's not the right word for it. No, no, no. I think I think um you actually you actually brought up something that we did not talk about beforehand, but is but is directly relevant to that. So first of all, everyone is addicted to easy money. And I'm mm-hmm. when I mean everyone, I mean, you know, the the markets themselves. You know, what they did in the 70s to make everyone addicted to welfare or or you know or um uh social safety net taken care of with food stamps, they've done in the O's and tens and twenties, making everyone addicted to uh, uh, white collar welfare, for lack of a better word. So, so I believe that culturally, since QE got it got going, uh, today's yesterday's incentive has become today's expectation. So everybody, yeah, great way expects, to put it, right? Mm-hmm. There's, I mean, there's a really good cliche about that. I can't remember what it is, but. Today's incentive is tomorrow's uh, budget or something like that. Anyway, but that's the idea, right? It's gotten ingrained in us. So the, I'm bringing this back to what you just said. The second half of what you just said, I think, was pretty uh, poignant in the sense that um, uh, uh, what caused this to happen if the Fed hasn't eased? And there's there's another piece to this, and it has to do with Yellen, right? Uh, or Or you can... Make her the poster child or poster idiot uh, for this. Sorry, Janet, but you you hurt my feelings. I thought you were smart, but you're not. Um, um, uh, you, you can make her the poster child for this, but but what it really is 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 just Powell raising rates. I think we're going to look back on this and see this. Powell raising rates did permit or enable stocks to stop rallying maybe not sell off because of the culture and because of the expectations but stop rallying the market kept rallying now why did it keep rallying well for a year as i as i implied we're all expecting power to cut no the market rallied because of what yellen did right now it's easy to to dump on her and i like doing that but you know noriel rubini and uh uh, I forget the guy's name. Someone that someone that his strategist uh, Mirren or or Morin, um, uh, they came out with a concept which which makes sense. I wish they had flushed it out a little bit better, but it makes sense. But while Powell was raising, the fiscal side of the government was easing. Now we know the first part of this. The first part of this is the Inflation Reduction Act, the fiscal spending, the giving money out to rebuild manufacturing. Necessary, but sloppy. Okay, mm-hmm. let's. I feel it's necessary. I also feel it's sloppy. You know, bridges to nowhere get built. That type of stuff, right? And that's the fiscal spending. You know, of course, spending it on climate change. That's ridiculous. You know, spending it on you know uh, throwing money at at windmills when you should be throwing money at you know getting copper wires that actually work in the U.S. And so power grids don't shut down. You know, the misallocation that, that the government's involved. So what do you expect there? But but. That's the one that we know of. The fiscal spending after COVID is to fix the economy, to be manufacturing economy. Okay, I don't like it, but it has to be done. I'll bite that bullet. Then the Rabini thing, right? He comes out and he says, well, Yellen, and he's right, you know, Yellen was supposed to borrow that money at the long-term end. 80% of, I'm going to make a number up, 80% of the money they're supposed to borrow is, say, 10 to 20 years out. And the other 20% is like T-bills, 90 days out. Mm -hmm. And what she did was she didn't borrow anything out there. She borrowed everything short-term. Now, 
if the market knows this, then why does it matter, right? But apparently the market didn't know it because bonds were getting hammered because Japan was selling, because China was selling, because everyone was selling, because, you know, inflation's not being far hard enough. So what she said, and everyone thought, oh, we, we can't, we can't, we're not going to stop the spending. If we're not going to stop the spending, then long-term yields need to go up, period. And so she said, oh, yeah? Well, I'm not going to borrow out there. I'm going to borrow short dated, which I'm not going to get into it now, but that's a disaster in waiting to happen. It's like rolling your problem down. It's like playing Martin uh, with the Martingale system, black, 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 until it comes up on black. And normally it's a problem, Uh, but she gets away with it by borrowing short simultaneously. So now there's one less seller of bonds out there. Bonds start to rally. The UK is now buying bonds. Everyone's buying bonds under, I think, three suppositions. Three, three suppositions. One, the Fed's going to ease. Two, there's going to be recession, related but not the same. And three, Yellen told us she's not going to borrow out there anymore. So let's load up on them. And so the bond market rallied. And so, and and you know, why did this happen? Now I'm going to bring. Now I want to answer your question. Why did this happen? Because Yellen's for the second half of the year is not going to borrow short term. And so she's not going to borrow as much at all. So fiscal spending ramps down the second half of the year. That's a heart net uh, paraphrase. And if fiscal spending ramps down, that may be good for put funds, but it's bad for the economy. And so now everyone's thinking unemployment's upticking, uh, inflation is in check. And Powell's not easing rates yet. And you got your hand out for yelling. She's like, I'm done. I don't have any more money to, to, to give you. You're like, oh, shit, what are we going to do? And then the yen carry trade implodes and all this stuff happens. So it's quite possible that it's quite possible that they need, the, the, to the point, they need Powell to ease and restore the Fed put because the last year has been subsidized by the yelling put. Mm. she's no longer giving the market free money. Stealth QE is the phrase that we're hearing starting to get thrown around. The stealth QE is over and Powell, they need Powell to ease. Now, why is that important from a different perspective? Powell and Yellen don't get along. Economically, they don't get along. And so Powell has been keeping rates high because she has been spending like a drunken mushroom imbibing sailor. You know, like, so that's why I mean that's my opinion, right? That's why that's why Powell has been keeping rates up. So I think it all happens like, oh shit, Yellen's done spending, Powell hasn't lowered rates, unemployment's upticking, Japan's raising rates. Oh, well shit, let's unwind our Nvidia, you know, and and that's what happened anyway. Long story, but you know. Well, it touches uh, on a lot of important points, Vince. And you know, We've kind of seen Yellen and Powell kind of really working against each other here. What would what would the country look like if we had a Treasury Secretary and a Fed Chairman actually working somewhat together? Oh, that's 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 a good question. You didn't tell me you want to ask that one. That's a good question. Hey, hey, sometimes I come up with stuff off the top of my head. Screw that. Okay, no, (laughs) I mean. No, but it's it's a well, it's, it's a logical question, you know. God forbid uh, we be logical. Okay, I can give you the one scenario, mm-hmm. right? And the one scenario which happened was the seventies. During the seventies, the fiscal side, the Yellen side, the fiscal side, the Treasury side, spent like drunken sailors, not on rebuilding the economy. They spent on the social uh, safety net, and for good reasons. You know, you had you had you know increase uh, in you had spending because of civil rights came into being. Uh, you had, you know, medicine, and you had basically a lot of people getting fired uh, because inflation was was green uh, green stamps, green stamps, food stamps, whatever. All kinds of stamps are coming out, and the welfare payrolls grew. Now that was the fiscal side spending money, not to rebuild the country, but spending money, bad for our bonds. The Fed at the time, uh, Burns, Arthur Burns. Um, uh, he claimed to be fighting the excessive spending, but he didn't. He completely accommodated it, and then some. He caved 
from pressure by Congress and by the Fed. Now, on that I'm not making up. There's a paper he wrote, a lecture he gave after he was out of office. They always seem to tell the truth when they're out of the office, mm -hmm. where he says, I could not fight uh, the Treasury and the Congress. They kept spending and spending and spending. I could not fight it. And so as a result, I caved. So the result is you had the 70s inflation, uh, which ended in the 80s, 70s inflation, 70s stagflation, 80s recession. And then you had the the, the Reagan uh, era happen after, after Volcker did his work. So that's an example of them working together, right? Mm -hmm. Burns may not have wanted to admit it, but he enabled the fiscal side. He went along to get along, you know. So if they work together now, people love the Fed and the Treasury working together. I'm going to tell you, I hate it. They need to be opposite each other, in my opinion, right? So if the Fed and the Treasury work together now, let's pretend that Powell never raised. Where would inflation be? But let's pretend that he started cutting six months ago. Do you think, this is the problem, do you think Yellen would spend less? Oh, he's lowering rates. I'll spend less. No, she wouldn't spend less. Mm -hmm. She would spend the same amount or more. The velocity of money would increase while the supply of money was increasing. So if they worked together from a dovish point of view, we would have raging inflation. It would, you know, it would, Powell did his job, you know, like, you know, I'm not a fan of the Fed, but Powell's the lesser evil right now. Now, mm -hmm. flipping it, suppose they both got hawkish. We, we could be in a depression. We really could. We really could, because if Powell goes 5% and Yellen says all of a sudden, I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative, we're not going to spend money on anything. Well, screw that. We're done. We're done. And so- Well, they would still have to respect their mandate. Right. But they lie. They, they, I'm not trying to be a Tim Fohat person here, but they can rationalize their mandate. So, for example, uh, uh, the Fed mandate. The Fed has a dual mandate, and that dual mandate is full employment, simplifying it, and stable prices, right? Mm -hmm. During, that's his mandate, not inflation or no inflation, stable prices, okay, and full employment. During COVID, he amended verbally, I have it on tape somewhere, tape, listen to me, how old am, am I? Um, he amended the mandate. The full employment mandate isn't full employment anymore. It's full employment, uh, equitable employment. Now, that argues for more easing. So he would never be able to be fiscally tight. And during COVID, he actually said his second mandate isn't price stability. It's inflation. Inflation is his second mandate. We need inflation. Anyway, they can twist whatever they want. They can rationalize their mandates whatever they want. But to answer you more uh, uh, more specifically, yeah, I suppose if we were in a depression, uh, they would have to change their mandate, but they would change their mandate after we're in a depression. You know what I mean? Like, like, like raising rates and being fiscally conservative in the, in the eighties, we retooled the economy. We did. We went from manufacturing to service and it worked. Right. But if we're causing a recession now, I think we could handle a recession. I really do. I mean, it's not like you can't, you know, getting a cold is what makes you more healthy when it's over with. You know, you get a cold, you don't get it again. You get another cold. But you, the, the point is, the point is, if we went, to, I guess what I'm trying to say is if we, if they agree with each other on the fiscal side, then they would, yeah, they would have to ignore their mandates a little bit. But that's the political bias. Anyway, I like the fact that they're not talking to each other. I think we're in the best. This is the Goldilocks of the anti-Goldilocks. And if either one of them caves, it's a disaster. Now, that sounds kind of facile, but I, I want to explain why. 2% inflation is not possible with 3% unemployment anymore. The market's different. If you want 2% inflation, you need 5% unemployment. Mm -hmm. If you want 3% unemployment, you need 5% inflation. The, the, the legs of the table are no longer balanced. 
and they're no longer balanced, not out of the clear blue sky, they're no longer balanced because we're not global anymore. We can't buy from China and let them, they're not borrowing our bonds. We're not buying their stuff. And so we can't finance things. And so I think we're going to find out that the natural equilibrium of this three-legged stool, one leg is inflation, one leg is unemployment, one leg is GDP, uh, is that the legs are off balance and they need to rebalance. With inflation at 3%, with unemployment at 4 to 4.5%, and with GDP at whatever, 12%, whatever they're going to make it up as. But but I think what I'm trying to say is that is that you can't balance it right now uh, at the levels they want to. And I think they're trying to force a square peg into a round hole a little too hard. Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's a really long uh, slapdash explanation, but well, that's, that's it. this, this show is never short on nuance, Vince. <laughs> right. Exactly. So oh. is it possible that the way that Yellen has issued T-bills has changed the shape of the, of the yield curve such that the recessionary signal that we usually get from an inverted yield curve actually is sending a misleading signal to the market that it normally reacts to. But because of this structure, it changes that signal. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. The, the, the first part, is yelling borrowing at the short end affecting the yield curve? Yes. It's affecting the yield curve by steepening it because she can't move the short-term rates because that's Fed determined. She can borrow all she wants at that. But by borrowing all she wants at that, she's driving the longer-term yields lower, and that inverts it more. The fronts stay where they are, the backs drop. So she's inverting it more, and, and mathematically, she's creating a worse recession down the road. So the yield curve inverting, just as so we're on the same page, a yield curve inverting says we're going to have a recession. Mm -hmm. A yield curve uninverting, the front's coming down, is the recession starting to manifest. Okay, so, so the reason a yield curve inverting says we're going to have a recession is because you invert a yield curve to fight inflation. I'll give everyone 5% money. They'll keep their money in money markets uh, and they'll stop spending money, you know, on GI Joe with the Kung Fu grip and the long-term yields, the long-term yields will stay low because we sense that inflation is being taken care of. The long-term yields are the fundamental anchor, right? Okay. And as that yield curve starts to crack, uh, it's cracking because, well, the Fed starts to ease rates. As it cracks, you're creating a recession but you're also simultaneously throwing money into the market. So it's kind of like the recession is guaranteed by inverted yield curve. And it doesn't happen until the yield curve starts to uninvert. Okay. So, and the reason it uninverts is because the Fed fucking lowers rates. Duh. You know, they see the reason. So if you were to invert a yield curve and do nothing, just let it be inverted, you start a depression. Because nobody wants to invest in the country long term because yields are too low. Right. And nobody wants to invest in stocks. Maybe they do, but 5% free money, you just keep putting your money in that. And people just put their money in their bank mattress. So you create a depression that way. So that's the first part. The first part is, did she, to, to just to come back to it, did she change the yield curve and affect the recession? Yes. She changed the yield curve and she affected the recession she, it looks like she was trying to, her behavior speeds up the need for the Fed to ease because she speeds up the recession coming faster. Okay. And you're like, well, the Fed, the recession didn't come fast. That's because she was also spending money at the same time. So there's that, right? So she definitely changed the dynamic of the re of the recession and the yield curve. What's the second part that you said? Because that was actually uh, more interesting, but I've already forgotten it, and you've forgotten it already too. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's always <laughs> an a, an evolving conversation. But basically, what I was asking is, you know, trying to understand 
if the signal is invalidated because of the structure of the yield curve oh. that she's been selling so many short term. No, T-bills. it's not. Inv- right, 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 right. Is the signal invalidated because she was working T bills? No, it's not. And and and, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why why it's well. The signal's not invalidated, but I don't know how bad the recession will be. It's kind of like, kind of like, it's not kind of like anything. It is long-term yields are artificially low. Let's start with that. We agree on this, right? Long-term yields are artificially low as a result of, we'll work this out. As a result of her squishing all the money in the front of the curve, if long-term yields are artificially low, this is the stealth QE part, she, money gets put into stocks. So stocks are too high because long-term yields are too low, but the real economy is in the shitter. That's it. Stocks are too high. The, the, The financial economy rips apart that's where the break is it doesn't delay the signal it it tears the correlation up right so this is me thinking out loud i think i'm right on this um uh long-term yields are too low artificially this comes back to something that zoltan said long-term yields are too low artificially and so people with money put it in the stock market but meanwhile the real economy is slowing down there's your there's your k uh, the the things going up and the things going down and because more money is being borrowed and that money is going from the 30 day uh, money market to the stock market because bonds are artificially kept too low. Well, no one's going to be investing in the economy itself. So it delays the signal. It prolongs high stocks because she was trying to keep stocks high. Right. And when the yield curve finally uninverts, it is, in my opinion, in my opinion, assuming she did not cut back on fiscal spending, incredibly inflationary. That's it. That's what I think. I think, I think, uh, I'll think something else in five minutes, but no, I I think she's kept long-term yields too low and she's borrowed at the short end. And if the Fed lowers borrowing costs to her, then she can borrow more. And the long-term yields will, the dollar cracks. That's what happens. The dollar cracks. So the Fed, if if here's here's how it goes, right? He lowers rates and she keeps borrowing the same amount, let's say more or less. Long-term yields start to climb. We get a much steeper yield curve. We get a a seesaw effect, which we saw right before the end thing. The seesaw effect happened. Long, short-term rates came down, long-term rates climbed. And that was very like people are like, what the hell does that mean? It means that the market says recession and inflation at the same time. It means that the market says stagflation. So Powell eases, here's the step, Powell eases, Yellen doesn't stop spending, long-term yields go up, yield curve control starts. And that's it. And we start buying bonds again. The bonds that were being bought by the Treasury now get bought by the Fed. It goes back and forth. And it's basically a big hide the P game. And inflation manifests at 4%. And unemployment manifests at 5%. That's it. I think the dollar gets shit on. That's what I think. The dollar gets shit on when this is all over. Mind you, we have skills at exporting our inflation. Maybe the euro gets shit on even more. Uh, but yeah, this comes out with, with eventually it comes out with yield curve control, probably in the next six months to year and a half. And it lasts for like five years. That's what I think. Right. So Vince, we're going to jump around a little bit here, but you broke a story a couple of weeks ago about this this gold trader in China that was actually buying gold futures and inflicting some damage on some of the bullion banks and i believe jp morgan was actually kind of counter that trade so why don't you run us through what you found and and even how you found it because i think it was i think it was great work on your part to be able to even find this. I don't know that anybody else was really looking in those places. Is this part of the episode sponsored by Google Translate? Because <laughs> that's what I use. No, no. Um, the, reason I, the reason I wanted to look for it 
here's what happened, right? Let's start with what happened. And, and I don't think I have to go down a rabbit hole on this because this is what happened. It's not, it's not theory. Um, uh, gold rallied when it shouldn't have because everyone was selling it and gold wasn't going down. And I have been paying close attention to uh, China's behavior and the premiums. Uh, and, and I was told that China was buying not just the PBOC, but uh, they call them Shanghai traders. I'm like, who the hell are these Shanghai traders? And these Shanghai traders turn out to be very, very big uh, hedge funds operating out of China and nearby. Essentially, they're uh, the Chinese banks operating uh, hedge funds. That's the way to look at it. So I saw in the in the uh, in the open interest, I saw some telltale signs that a bullion bank was getting hurt, at least one bullion bank. And so I called uh, 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 Bai Zhaojun, a uh, colleague, mainland China, and I said, who's buying over there? And he said, well, we have, you know, big buyers. I can't really say who they are, uh, but we're buying more than usual. I go, but the PBOC is not buying. He goes, well, yeah, but we're still buying, you know, the, the PBOC but, but are they not officially. Are they not like arms of the PBOC, really? Because everything yeah, well, that's seems it. to be controlled. Yeah, that's a command economy. I mean, you know, like we're that way as well. And I don't want to be cynical about it, but you know, the PBOC, the state controls everything, and so the state wants everything to do well. So they say, "Hey, listen, uh, uh, you can buy or you can't buy." And that, that I mean, that, they won't deny it. They just don't want to talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. But that's how it works. So it's kind of like uh, the 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 state or the CCP uh, runs the economy and they uh, give a taste to the banks to let them, you know, to let them do their thing. But anyway, so I'm like, okay, so fine. You guys are still buying. If the PBOC hasn't stopped buying, you're just buying through unofficial ranks. Okay, fine. So, so uh, then, then, then there's this, then I start seeing this name, uh, Jean Kai futures pop up. I'm like, who the hell? Like, Big funds like Zhang Kai Futures are buying. Like, what the hell is that? You know. So I, I did a little exploring, and, and the bottom line is, in China, the Shanghai Traders Group is really just these hedge funds that are created by Chinese conglomerates. They create these trading vehicles, and they say, "Oh, you know what? Uh, I make, you know, I make TV stands. If if they still exist, maybe they do in China. I don't know. I make TV stands." I'm going to borrow, uh, you know, a billion yuan from the PBOC, and I'm going to trade gold. All of a sudden, you know, you get these like what? So you have like five or six of these guys buying, and there were all kinds of tells and fingerprints that it didn't make sense. The options volumes were exploding over the counter. Nothing was happening on the COMEX, and the market rallies again. And the market rallies a lot. And and uh, and I'm doing my daily surf of Chinese stuff. Uh, and and I see this, you know, uh, Zhang Kai makes basically in, in simple English, Zhang Kai makes money, JP Morgan loses money. I'm like, damn, who who, who says that and gets away with it? Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I looked at the story and I translated it. And the bottom line is these Shanghai traders that everyone talks about, but nobody knows what they do. They were trading over the counter, which means off exchange with JP Morgan in the U.S. on physical contract deliveries and over the counter in Shanghai on physical deliveries. And you can verify that by going to the exchange and seeing who the counterparties are. That's disclo- That's uh, findable in China. And I did that. Uh, and then the article goes on uh, and it says, beyond... Xi Ming, I think is how you say his name. He's the guy who runs Zhang Kai Futures. Uh, I called him the China Hunt brother. He had been buying and telling people, China, telling people, I'm buying gold, I'm buying silver. And the banks, JP Morgan and others, were selling it to them, expecting it to be your typical hedge fund that's going to sell. But they didn't. They just kept buying, they kept buying. So I think they caused a, a big hit on the uh uh the western bullion banks and i don't think jp morgan you know 
J.P. Morgan's not going to comment on it, so we're speculating here. But I, I think, not speculating, it's conjecture. I think J.P. Morgan probably laid off some of the risk to the other bullion banks. And the smaller guys got hurt. And I think at some point, the Bank of International Settlements got involved and kind of bailed them out. I'm talking about that now in one of my other posts. But um, the long and short of it is, you could keep gold, and this is for the people that think gold's manipulated. It is, right? You can keep gold and silver capped when everyone plays in the same sandbox as you. Everyone deals in dollars. Everyone is a customer of JP Morgan. Everyone uh, is subject to the same rules that the Fed puts in place for the COMEX. But now you've got a gorilla outside the sandbox who has access to it, who's coming in. And so in the past, there have been plenty of gorillas that they that they crushed eventually. It's a waiting game, but this one they lost to. And who did they lose to? Well, they lost to a guy who makes PVC pipe, who decides he wants to trade futures. They lost to another guy who makes, you know, legs for tables, you know, on spinning lathes who decided he wanted to trade futures. I mean, one of those is real. The other one I just kind of made up. The mm -hmm. legs thing I just kind of made up. But the PVC pipe is real, like PVC company that trades futures. So so are you trading against the PVC plastic pipe manufacturer who got lucky? Or are you trading against a gorilla? And the gorilla is another central bank. So I think we're looking at uh, essentially uh, a war uh, a battle, a skirmish war being fought between the PBOC and the Fed uh, through the bullion banks and the Shanghai traders uh, mm -hmm. in in in, uh, in the gold market. So that's it. Yeah. And he, by the way, just to give you some prognosis, he's long. He bought again in the last two months. He may be buying to sell, but he's buying. I don't think he's going to sell this time because the BRICS summit is coming in. So I think the banks are more cautious this time. That's it. So, you know, you say the banks are more cautious this time. Does that mean that their positioning is changing now, Vince? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, uh, simple answer to that is yes. Uh, I think the first wave, the, the banks are genetically short the market. Why? Because speculative funds buy gold. And so they're constantly selling it. And they just wait. It's kind of like a poker game. You know, it's like they wait till they get a good hand. And then they just go all in and they force all the speculative funds to sell. So it's like, you know, they get pocket aces and they just keep raising, meaning keep getting shorter until the funds run out of money. And they and they win that way. Uh, but this last time, starting December 3rd, gold went sideways for almost three months, for three months. And then on March 3rd, almost exactly three months later, gold spiked higher. Now, why is that? Because the guys who bought on December 3rd and after held it for three months and did not give a shit about them raising the pot. They kept buying. And on March 3rd, the market exploded. Between March and May, they learned their lesson, I believe, at least partially. They covered shorts, the banks. They're carrying a smaller short position than normal at these prices. But they're still the wrong way on this position. And there's still short options. And I think while as a whole, the industry may be improving, meaning they're getting less short, they're having a hard time finding people to buy from. No one's selling. The miners aren't. When's the last time you heard about a miner hedging or producer hedging? I don't even know if they have any anymore. You know, Canada's probably Canada's probably saying that's ours. You can't take it. That's ours. You know, mm -hmm. or or the U.S. is probably saying it as well. But you know, I think I think uh, I think the banks as an industry are learning that they can't play bias short all the time. But simultaneously, uh, within the banks, there are smaller banks who probably are slow to learn the lesson and will continue to get hurt. And they got hurt as recently as three weeks ago. When gold when gold spiked, uh, they were short. And the reason they, I know they got hurt is because they covered. If you cover your shorts in your bank, you're folding your hand at the table. So, yes, uh, they're getting better at it, but uh, there's still a long way to go there. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of jumping around to a completely orthogonal topic here, Vince. Something that 
I really appreciated your explanation on, and of course, you know, looking back over this last four-year Biden presidency, there seems to be a lot of things that, you know, can be pointed to that really upsets people. And I think selling off the SPR was one of those things. So right. you gave me a really interesting explanation on, let's say, the evolving nature of the SPR and why it doesn't necessarily serve the same purpose. And we don't necessarily have to refill it to the same extent that we would have previously. So if you could walk us through that, I think that's a, it's a really interesting thing to understand because we don't want to stay stuck in this, you know, let's say almost like amber, like have, have resin poured on our thoughts to only think about the SPR in one day or in one way. Right. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, look, I'm of the, I'm of the opinion that us selling the SPR was a problem, but it had to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to give you what I think the government thought when they were selling it. Some facts that weren't touched on that make you say, Oh, it really wasn't that bad. And then some other facts, uh, of changes in policy that make me realize they're not worried about it. Now, mind you, it caused gasoline prices to go up. It did. Not selling the SPR, the fact that we were selling... All right, let me just stay on the SPR. Europe had a, Europe had a, a, a finished products crisis. They needed diesel, they needed you know whatever they need, heating oil, whatever they call it, their gas oil. They needed that, and we were exporting our stuff to them. We're selling our finished products to them. So while gasoline, so while we were selling the SPR, depressing the price of oil, yay, that doesn't depress the price of gasoline because we were selling our finished products, you know, to Europe because they were making more money off of it there. So it caused inflation here. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the SPR selling didn't cause inflation. Okay, so let me just let me just focus on the SPR. Right? The SPR uh is an emergency reserve for times of war. Now, we are in a very ge- geopolitically unrestful situation. So why would you sell the SPR? I agree. You're crazy to do that now. And notice we're not selling it anymore, right? But during COVID, we sold it, All right? So here's, I think, what, 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 what needs to be gotten to. When we announced we were selling the SPR, we were encouraging everyone to front run us. We wanted it to go down. We were trying to hurt OPEC. That's why we made a big announcement of it, which also helped people that said, well, that's a bad idea and made them a little bit more urgent in their panic. And, you know, I was one of those people as well. But, you know, my colleague, Brent Kelly, who's, you know, understands oil like I do, but also has a deep fundamental understanding of it. She took apart the contracts uh, that, that went into the SPR. And this is what she said to me. She said, well... In 2000, and I don't know what it was, 2016 or 2014, or it may have been as far back as 2012, the government decided they were going to start drawing down the SPR anyway. They're going to start depleting it slowly. Every year, take out so much. Now, the two reasons for that were, number one, the SPR taverns or whatever holds them need to be uh, need to be refurbished. They needed, they needed new work done. And number two... Uh, they were trying to be green, right? So, but the real reason is they wanted to monetize the oil like it's a printing press. They wanted to sell it, the oil into the market, keep the price of oil prices down and take the profits and use it to spend on whatever it is they want to spend on. So when they announced they were selling the SPR, what they were doing was they have a budget to sell, let's say, a barrel a day every day for the next five years. They took the next five years selling and sold it in one day. Okay, They were budgeted to sell uh, the oil anyway, but they sold it at a time when it looks like we really, really needed it. And it worked, but it left us open in the future to problems. We have oil that we can't sell in the future and oil, if things get worse, we need to. Well, overnight, the government 
went from it. If, if you look back on the headlines, it was like big oil is this is Biden, right? Big oil is gouging us. You know, no, no, they weren't. They weren't gouging at all. Like your economics caused that, you know, and the fact that Europe is, you know, suffering uh, and big oil is selling their finished products over there to make money. That's why we're suffering because you fucking sanctioned Russia. And that's started the whole, maybe Russia started it by invading, but financially we exacerbated the situation and you were paid the price. Anyway, so so back back to the SPR. So we've drained the SPR and now we're like, who are we blaming inflation for today? Well, let's blame the big oil guys. That's why oil prices are up, right? right. And let's blame OPEC and let's blame whoever else, the price gougers. Well, six months later, below the radar, the Biden administration says you can drill for more, not domestically, overseas. You can expand existing drills, not new drills, but you can pull. You, we want you to buy shale companies. We want you to produce more oil, but we're not going to talk about it. And that's what happened. So, so basically, the Biden administration said, we hate oil. Please drill some more. We hate oil. We like climate change. We like climate uh, neutral stuff. Please drill some more oil. And then the oil that they, the oil that they, uh, that they, that they sold, they sold it to these big companies. And the big companies made gasoline and made profits off of it. But some of it was sold on loan. The big oil companies have to replenish some of the oil that was sold out of the SPR going forward. So the government says we're going to sell a, a million barrels of oil. And over the next five years, 200,000 are coming back. So we are getting, it's like a loan. Mm -hmm. It's a loan. So we basically uh, made a big deal out of selling the SPR. And it was a big deal. And it will be a big deal again if we have to do it in order to manipulate the price of oil down in, oil to, in order to um, uh, give the illusion that there was no inflation and in order to uh, create a situation where we can monetize oil that we're carrying on our books at, I don't know, $10, $12, $15 a barrel. So the SPR uh, will be refilled at least part way, but it will never be what it was. And that's why we have to get off of oil. Forget about destroying the world. We don't have enough of it. And we need to uh, either replenish it faster or um, or uh, come up with alternatives. You know, the mm -hmm. Buy America thorium reactor concept. But anyway. That's it. The SPR was a big deal when it happened, and it hurt Europe. It did not hurt us, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But do we still have the same need to have the same level of oil in reserve that we did in, let's say, the seventies, Vince? Uh, no, no. But we could again. So no, we embargo our ability to embargo in the future Iran or whoever stemmed from uh, us being able to in the future after after the embargo stemmed from filling the SPR reserve but now we don't have to keep that much oil uh in storage it's a passive not a pacifier it's a safety valve that we don't need uh because we can drill for it that much easier or we can just invade Venezuela but all kidding aside the problem is and this is a this is a real problem what we need is a strategic gasoline and strategic heating oil reserve. See, this green climate stuff, forget about the oil. You're not allowed to build a new facility to hold oil. You're not allowed to build a new facility to make gasoline. No more refineries are being built. No more new storage areas. And so we're not making, it's manufacturing. We're mm. not manufacturing enough finished product so oil could go to zero and gasoline will be five dollars a gallon because why because i have all the oil in the world but i don't have a refinery to crack the oil and make gasoline so what we need is a reserve for refined products now that's a pipe dream because gasoline has to be recycled every 90 to 180 days mm. or you can keep for a decade so it, it, it's a hard thing to do. So yeah, oil's not the problem. Finished products are the problem. And frankly, uh, because our, we're the biggest oil producer in the world, 
which is really the bottom line is we're the biggest oil producer in the world. Why do we need an SPR? You know what? That's a valid point. However, if we're not drilling for oil and we're not allowed to produce that oil, you'll notice we weren't allowed to produce that oil during COVID because of the riots and the green energy and the tomato paste being thrown, tomato sauce being thrown on art paintings, you know, whatever the bullshit is. It's all bullshit, right? Um, we weren't allowed to drill for it, uh, but now we're drilling for it again. So if we're drilling for it. We don't need it. So we need gasoline and heating oil. And di- we need diesel. You can't keep diesel forever. That's the problem. That's it. Right. So Vince, you know, I've I've had some recent conversations and I don't know exactly if this conversation is going to come out first or the other one, but basically, you know, seeing what the raise in rates has done to the rest of the world and seeing the strength that the U S still has, would you ever think that we should be seeing the trade being gold versus the dollar or is it gold and the dollar? Um, no, you teed that up for me. Thank you. Um, it should be gold and the dollar. Interview over. No, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, mic drop. <laughs> I think you dropped. No, no, mic drop. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, um, no, um, I think if you look at the world as a static place that's not evolving, that's not improving, and maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not. But if you look at it that way, it's a sum zero game, and if it is a sum zero game, then uh, the dollar goes down and oil, I'm sorry, and gold goes up. Uh, and and certainly we're seeing not the dollar go down, which by the way, that's why the whole milkshake thing is not wrong. Uh, the dollar is not going to zero. To exaggerate, treasuries are going to zero. Mm-hmm. You know, People still need dollars because there's a currency, but the store of value is going from treasuries to gold. Not 100%, but that, that's happening a little bit. But the, I, I guess the real, the real point of, of the gold dollar split is you don't have to hate America to love gold. Okay. I'm I believe that as idiotic as the people are that run this country, as 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 dependent as they are on the innovation uh that we have that helps keep this country alive, as as manipulative as they are of the laws that we have in this country, uh, we still have them and no one else does. And so I believe to Bet against the dollar is to bet against the U.S. If the dollar goes to five, every other currency is going to be four. You know, that's how I look at it. And and ultimately, ultimately, I see gold as a bridge to a better economy. I will never short gold. But gold is like, you know what? If I'm, and I'm paraphrasing something you said, uh, if I'm buying gold, I'm buying gold because my currency sucks. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what everyone's doing over there, right? Uh, they're worried about their own currency. Uh, in the U.S., you're buying gold to hedge against the dollar going down, but you're not hedging against America. You know, the dollar's going to go up because you know the the analogy is: let's say you put you put um a barrel of oil between there's one barrel of oil, and you got the U.S. on one side of that barrel of oil, and you've got um I don't know, pick another country. Uh, you've got uh, I don't know uh, China on the other side of it. On the other side of it, I believe not being negative towards China here. I believe that if the playing field is even for resources, we both have oil. The oil is sitting right there, and we have to do something innovative with it. I believe the U.S. will do it first and do it better. Now, I'm not 100 percent that we're going to be doing it, and China won't do it. China will do it as well. Because state-controlled economies can get shit going as well, too. But I believe that if you compare the U.S. to, say, all of Europe with that barrel of oil in the middle, we're going to do something with it that's innovative, that people want. And that's why you own the dollar. You own the intellectual capital and the rule of law that's behind the U.S. You don't own it uh, uh, because of uh, of the people in charge. So uh, I, think, I think when you look at the innovations that are going to come down the road, oil will go to zero before the dollar. That's kind of an aggressive thing to say, but I believe that, you know, and there are people out there that will push back that are very um, focused on uh, peak oil, 
And you know what? I can't argue with him, but I just I just kind of think that we'll overcome that somehow. You know, like if there's peak oil, that's great. There'll be thorium salt reactors creating energy for free as a result of that because we respond well under pressure and we're under pressure again. Does so that so that's, that's the, let's say the main explanation of why you say oil going to zero, because we're going to replace that energy source with other, right. like, like thorium reactors. Right, right, right. I mean, look, oil's not going, look, let's, let's, all the people that are very in here and now, there's nothing in the world except for nuclear that produces the amount of energy that oil does as efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. There's no but there. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. But we can no longer, and this is, by the way, the Machiavellian part of it, and we're the biggest producer of oil. Let's pretend that we're depleting our oil. Let's pretend there's peak oil. Great. There's peak oil. We're running out of oil. And when you look at the bricks, they're oil focused. They make their money selling oil and they make their money doing stuff with oil, right? We need, speaking completely as a biased American patriot, we need to replace oil. Screw the climate, screw the earth. I mean, don't screw them, but you get my point. Mm -hmm. Screw those things. We need to do it to stay competitive. Yeah. In order, look, we need to figure out how to use oil while they're using whale oil. We need to figure out how to build the thorium reactor uh, more efficiently. We need to figure out how to do these things because we have incentive now because the BRICS are, China's breathing down our neck as well they should. And they're not behind the curve on thorium reactors. I love that because a buddy of mine keeps calling me up saying, hey, Vince, did you buy any salt today? I'm like, why? He goes, because <laughs> thorium reactors are next. Buy salt, sell oil. Yeah, he's goofing around, but he's a trader, so he thinks that way. Anyway, China is technologically where we are. And if they're not, if we do something, they'll figure it out in five years. So in the end, in the end, we have to continually innovate. So peak oil, we're running. I'll give it to you. The world's running out of oil. I don't think so, but I don't care. I don't have any skin in the game on that. We're running out of oil. All right, then we got to get off oil, right? Uh, China is using oil to build a war machine. All right, we got to get the price of, you know, we, we got to do something better than oil. If the price of oil goes down, that's great, you know, but if we're building, if we're building something with uh, energy and better computer chips, then they can't compete with us economically. If we're building the next new cool gadget, then every other country in the world is going to say, I want one with the next new iPhone, right? We build the next new iPhone with free energy and it's $5. And we're like, yeah, our economy is doing fine. We're bringing in more money than we're sending out. That's mercantilism, right? And in doing so, we're forcing them to compete with us and they can't because they're using oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, oil's a problem for us. We should make it a problem for them. Speaking again, very patriotically. So uh, I, I think we need innovations in energy and fine. If it saves the earth, that's fine. That's great. It's pretty cool. I think we need to save that. But anyway. Um, it kind of comes as a, as a package. But, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the, the idea that. What's that saying? That, that America will try every wrong answer before they find the right one? Um, that's Churchill, I think, who said that, right? Yeah. That that comes to mind. I don't know that the incentive structures are quite there that we're going to, you know, spark this innovation and, and get ahead of everybody else just because of the interests that are involved. Dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna dude you on that. Yes. You know, Churchill said uh America always talking about like getting help during the war, America always does the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities, mm -hmm. right? So taking that phrase and applying it to what you just said. Uh, yes, Vince, I agree with you. Uh, this is me being, Tom being nice, telling me I'm wrong. Yes, Vince, I agree with you, but are there too many other uh, distractors and partisan efforts that will make us take too long to get to doing the right thing? Yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem because we're a very abstract economy. We think about ideas. And because we think about ideas, we forget, oh shit, you actually need oil to do that. Oh shit, you, you can't just make windmills out of, you know, you know, Neo Keynesian air, you, you can't do that shit. And so it's like, we have to fuck up all the time to get to the right thing. 
The question is, to your point, implied, how many more times can we screw up before we run out of times to screw up? And the answer is, I don't think there's many, Mm -hmm. you know, considering considering that we're not retooling the economy from uh, a low deficit environment, you know, and China's, you know, China's yeah, that's the a great deal. point. Mm-hmm. China's the real deal. We need, you know, here's what we need to do. I'm telling you, everyone, we need to do this. We need to ensure that China has a deflationary crisis, which you can do with high interest rates and imploding a yen carry trade and supporting Japan. And we need to substitute, and then we need to know that Saudi Arabia can, and Russia can't make any money by selling oil, which is by inventing another oil source. And then we can rule the world. That's how evil the, the US is. Mm-hmm. I think that's what we're trying to do. It's crazy, but who knows? Yeah, it's it's I'm running for president. <laughs> Get your hats made. I'll I'll buy one. <laughs> but again, it's I mean it's important to consider these concepts and again extrapolate what you know raising rates actually means for the rest of the world and or and and downhill from that, also what it means for energy, what it means for innovation, all of these things. Yeah. I, I agree. You know, I, I want to throw something in there because it's geopolitical, but it's actually, I think it's important um, regarding energy, regarding the BRICS versus the US. Look at Japan. It's a shit show there. Now, look at the BRICS around Japan. What happens, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but what happens if North Korea and South Korea become united? Forget about the ideological and war risk. You've got East and West Germany reunifying. Mm-hmm. That puts Japan out of business. You know what I mean? Like as the BRICS grow or as the other Asian countries grow, Japan has become just a big aircraft carrier, you mm-hmm. know, for, for, for our planes. That's a like that's a race. Japan is in trouble. Germany is in trouble. And I'm bringing this back to your point. Can we afford to make too many more mistakes? No. No, we can't. We can't. I mean, can you imagine if, you know, China's like brokers a deal and South Korea is like, well, you know, this windmill stuff doesn't really work and we need some oil. Yeah, we'll partner with North Korea again. Like what? You know, Japan may as well sink if that happens, you know, mm-hmm. and the U.S. is like, oh, shit, well, we need to get our shit together and we need to stop with all this bullshit. Meanwhile, we have the luxury of having all kinds of energy as long as we're able to access it. What do you mean? It, what do you it, mean? In which part? <laughs> as as long as well, we regulatorily were allowed to access it. Oh yeah, that's my. I, I thought you were saying. I, I thought you were being like very cryptic. Like we have a lot of energy if we have a lot of energy. Yes, we have sources. That we have not been able to tap into because of these doing the wrong thing before. The right thing is the right thing is work on nuclear energy and drill more oil at the same time. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. You know, well, energy is so of- related to GDP. You would think that you would try to maximize your energy availability and your energy output while kind of having this eye on future tech, greener, greener tech more efficient use of energy, more efficient sources of energy, and understand that you're going to need an abundance of energy along with a grid that can support that. And, but again, you know, trying to do that on a four-year election cycle, the incentives don't always line up, right? As you said that, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, why don't we do that? Well, because if you were the advisor to Joe Biden, assuming he was cognitively uh, aware at the time, and you said that to him about what our policy should be, he'll be like, well, get me votes. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. It's like, you know, well, get me elected. They don't give a shit about that anymore. Like they don't, like people have been, as a nation, we've been dumbed down so much uh, in one hand, and on the other hand, have expectations of constant uh, freebies, whether it be a lower income person who's, forget lower income, that's that's not fair, middle class person who's encouraged to take out a credit card at 25% interest to keep up with the Joneses by buying something they can't afford, or 
or the Fed lowering rates so an upper wealthy affluent person can buy more stuff using his stock as income. Those things give the illusion of of um, staying power. And they make us think at the governmental level, well, shit, we can just stop drilling for oil. We can start making windmills. You know, it's like a South Park episode. Anyway, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, Vince, I think that's a good place to kind of end our little random episode of kind of meandering in a couple different topics. But, you know, again, this this stuff all ends up fitting together. You know, you can't really take one piece of it. And I mean, we could go, you know, a mile deep on something an inch wide, but it ends up kind of bleeding off into these other subjects. So I, I appreciate you helping kind of elucidate some of these ideas. Yeah, and, and and I appreciate your audience for sticking with us because I know that we I went down some rabbit holes and you gave me a lot of latitude. You should edit half of this shit out. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all tied together. I'll be like a libertarian uh, hippie. It's all tied together. We're you know? all one. <laughs> we, we, we're all one. We need to, you know, I, don't, I can't even come up with a joke, but yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, uh, we need to learn nuance again. Mm -hmm. absolutely of course for anybody that wants more of vince he puts out a ton of excellent material all available at vblgoldfix.substack.com and of course excellent twitter follow as well soren the k s-o-r-e-n-t-h-e-k vince thanks so much for your time today man really appreciate it thanks for having me it was fun hopefully your audience will enjoy it as well oh by the way you have this uh uh, this contrarian guy coming on. So mm -hmm. I look forward to that. And maybe before or after this, please let me know. Cause I think I want it. I want to hear if I'm crazy or not. When I talk about things like innovation supports the dollar and gold still going to go up mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. That's, that's Thank professor you. Joel Lippmann. So I'm, I'm oh, not yeah. sure if that comes out first or after this, but we'll see, but appreciate right. it. I'm plugging. I'm plugging it. I'm going to listen to it. Excellent. Thanks Vince. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.